The frost clung to us like a second skin as we trudged into base camp. The last light of day succumbing to the encroaching grip of twilight. Our breath sculpted ghostly wisps in the frigid air, each exhalation a testament to the living warmth still pulsing within our ice-clad forms. The mountain loomed above, indifferent to our presence, vast and untamed, a colossus of nature's raw majesty. I could feel the weight of my own desire anchoring every step, the need to stand triumphant atop these peaks, to gazette my name into the annals of those few who dared and succeeded. But it wasn't just the peak. It was the whispering challenge in every gust of wind, the unspoken dare in the sheer cliffs that beckoned me forward. We were a motley tapestry of ambition and fear, woven together by a common thread. The insatiable hunger to face the unknown, to stand where so few could, and to emerge victorious or not at all. Each of us carried our private motivations, but here, at the foot of the behemoth, we were united in our reverence and our folly. The mountain held its secrets close, and we, in our arrogance, believed we could wrest them free. The wind clawed at my face with icy talons as we trudged into the base camp, our footfalls muffled by the thick snow. The towering peaks loomed like sentinels around us, their jagged silhouettes etching a stark contrast against the leaden sky. A chill seeped through my layers, a relentless force that not even the most resolute could fend off. Stone, I called to Ryan, my breath forming a ghostly wisp in the air. This cold's got teeth. He nodded, the blue of his eyes glinting, a reflection of the ice that encased us. It'll bite harder come nightfall. We need shelter. His voice was lost in the howling gale, the sound a harbinger of nature's sheer power. We set to work, each movement deliberate, fighting against the gale's push and pull. But there was something else. A silence so profound, it felt like another presence among us. It clung to the edges of the wind's screams, a quiet too deep for comfort. Does anyone else feel that? Nina's question cut through the thin air. She stood still, a small figure against the immensity of the mountain, her gaze darting to the shifting shadows. Feel what? Sam's reply came steady, but her furrowed brow betrayed unease. Never mind, Nina muttered, shrugging off her unease as quickly as it had come. I watched Liam fumble with his camera, his usually steady hands shaking. Something's not right, he whispered more to himself than anyone else. Can you hear that? What? The wind? Dr. Archer asked, peering over his shoulder. No, not the wind. Like whispers, distant voices, Liam's eyes were wide, searching the expanse for a source that wasn't there. Mountains playing tricks on your mind, Antonia scoffed, though she cast a wary glance over her shoulder at the darkening crevices between the rocks. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, studied by an unseen observer with malicious intent. Xander seemed to sense it, too. His dark eyes reflected a knowing fear, a recognition of something beyond our understanding. Legends say, these mountains are alive, he murmured, almost to himself, that they breathe and listen. Maybe we should be careful about what we say out loud. Superstitions, Antonia declared, yet her voice lacked its usual conviction, drowned out by the wind's crescendo. As dusk began to claim the day, the darkness grew bold, creeping closer to our makeshift camp. Shadows danced erratically, untamed by any light, moving as if with purpose. I felt a prickle along my spine, an instinctual warning that we were trespassers here, vulnerable to the whims of this frozen titan. Let's get some rest, Ryan finally said, his tone brooking no argument. We'll need our strength. The wind fell to a whisper as I stumbled upon an oddity amidst the vast expanse of white. It was an altar stark against the snow, a ring of stones piled meticulously with an icicle, laden staff planted firmly at its center. My breath caught in my throat, not solely from the biting cold. The air around it felt charged, 
dense with unspoken reverence. Look at this, I called out, my voice sounding foreign in the silence that had settled over us. The others gathered around, their expressions a mixture of curiosity and exhaustion. None of us knew the true purpose of this stone sentinel. Its significance lay shrouded much like the peaks themselves, veiled by clouds and mystery. Let's not mess with things we don't understand, I suggested, but my words were drowned by the sound of Antonia's scoff. Primitive superstitions, she said, her eyes glinting with the thrill of defiance. Before any of us could react, she dealt a solid kick to one of the stones. The clatter of ice and rock sounded unnaturally loud, echoing off the mountain walls. Antonia, I shouted, my voice laced with alarm. Relax, she retorted, brushing off her hands as if ridding herself of the deed. But the atmosphere had shifted palpably. A sudden stillness descended, as if the very breath of the mountain had been drawn in, held in suspense. The whispers that had once seemed a figment of our imagination now carried a tangible resonance, stirring the hairs on the back of my neck. Leave it, Antonia insisted, her tone sharp. Let's go. Her arrogance unsettled me more deeply than the cold ever could. The altar lay in disarray, its destruction an ill omen. I could taste on the frozen air. We were intruders here, and our actions had not gone unnoticed. Ignorance was no shield against the wrath we might have awakened, wrath that slumbered within the very bones of these mountains. As nightfall encroached, the shadows stretched longer, reaching toward us with tendrils of darkness. We returned to our tents, each lost in thought, unable to shake the feeling that we had disturbed something ancient and powerful, something that would not be ignored. The world erupted. A tremor shook the ground beneath our worn boots. A violent shudder that spoke of ancient rage awakened. The mountain groaned, a sound so deep and primal it resonated within our very bones. We froze, eyes wide, our breaths stolen by the sudden betrayal of the earth. How? What was that? I stuttered, my voice barely rising above the ensuing cacophony. Rocks, once secure in their icy perches, now cascaded down the slopes, a deadly symphony of destruction resonating through the frigid air. An avalanche, someone gasped. Perhaps it was Ryan or Antonia. In that moment of horror, names seemed inconsequential. No, I countered, an inexplicable certainty gripping me. Something else. The wind howled with renewed fury, as if to confirm my fears. It was no longer just the weather. It was a wail, a lamentation that seemed to mourn the sanctity we had defiled. Shadows flitted at the edge of our vision, shapes and movements that defied the natural play of moonlight upon snow. In the disarray, our panic bred confusion. Our tents, once aligned in orderly rows, now appeared distant scattered by some malevolent hand. My heart hammered against my ribcage, urging me to escape, to flee from the terrifying unknown that clawed at the edges of my sanity. Stick together, I heard myself yell, though the sound was snatched away by the relentless wind. I reached out, seeking the reassurance of human touch, but found only emptiness. At once surrounded by my companions and utterly alone, a cry pierced the night, a sound of anguish that twisted my insides. Whether it was one of us or something far less human, I couldn't tell. The distinction had become meaningless. There was only the terror, the icy grip of fear that held us fast even as it urged us to run. Can't. Can't see, came a choked sob, the voice muffled by layers of frost and the omnipresent roar of the mountain's fury. Keep moving. I forced the command through chattering teeth, my own words doing little to quell the surge of dread that threatened to overwhelm me. We pushed forward, a blind scramble of limbs and terror. The mountain, indifferent to our plight, continued to rumble, its voice a portent of further horrors to come. In our hearts, we knew we were not merely battling the elements.
With every step we took, it felt as though unseen eyes followed, tracking our every move with predatory focus. The air grew heavy, charged with the threat of retribution. We were ensnared in a web of our own making, and the more we struggled, the tighter it became. Keep close, I muttered, reaching for the hand of the climber nearest to me. Our fingers entwined, a lifeline in the midst of chaos. But even as we sought solace in solidarity, our collective fear was palpable, a tangible force that fed the growing malevolence around us. We could not see our foe, but we could feel its wrath, a cold so penetrating it seemed to leach the very life from our bones. We stumbled forward, blind and desperate, knowing that with every faltering step, we were being drawn deeper into the spirit's domain. Stay together, I called out, my voice cracking with the strain of maintaining any semblance of control. But the truth gnawed at the edges of my resolve. We were facing a force beyond our comprehension, a malevolent entity that reveled in our mounting terror. As the wind howled like a banshee's wail, the mountain seemed to echo with the laughter of the gods, ancient, unforgiving deities who had marked us for daring to defy their sanctity. And in that harrowing moment, as the oppressive weight of our situation bore down upon us, I understood that we were not merely lost. We were cursed. I plunged a boot into the snow, its crust giving way to a deceptive softness beneath. Each step was an act of will, my muscles screaming protests I could no longer hear over the wind's relentless assault. The cold had long since numbed my face, but inside a fire raged, a fire fueled by guilt. Forward, I whispered to myself, the word a cracked, fragile thing in the frozen air. Beside me, Ella grappled with her own demons, her breaths coming in ragged gasps. She had come to conquer, to prove to herself that the mountains she'd climbed in life were nothing compared to these towering giants of ice and stone. But now, as shadows clung to her like shackles, I saw doubt etch itself across her features, her once indomitable spirit quivering under the weight of her choices. Can you hear them too? Her voice was a thin thread, barely reaching me. Hearing what? My mind teetered on the brink of madness, unsure if the voices were conjured by the wind or by something far more sinister. I dared not answer, for fear of confirming the reality of our torment. We advanced, the landscape transforming before us, each new horror unveiled with a cruel slowness. Shapes moved at the periphery of vision, dark figures that appeared human, only to dissolve into the blizzard when stared upon directly. The mountain was alive. The sense of foreboding sank its teeth deeper into my soul with every labored step. We were trespassers here, and the mountain knew it. It toyed with us, offering glimpses of false trails, only to lead us back to where we started, or worse, to the edge of bottomless chasms that yawned hungrily at our approach. Where are we going? James' question cut through the silence, his voice laced with panic. A seasoned climber, he had always prided himself on his unshakable resolve. Now, that resolve crumbled like the icy ledges we traversed, falling away into the abyss below. A sudden gust tore at us with unseen claws, sending us sprawling. I clawed at the snow, my fingers finding no purchase, the wind laughed, a sound both alien and intimate. It knew my name. It whispered it with a thousand voices, each syllable a condemnation. Buried in the suffocating dark, we clung to each other, waiting for the mountain to claim its due. When the tumult subsided, a deafening silence enveloped us. Antonia's arrogance had doomed us all. The mansion loomed like a specter above me, its silhouette etched against the gray sky. I stood at its base, my breath swirling into ghosts that danced away into the frost-bitten air. The hill upon which it perched was an island, isolated from the world below by more than just geography. It commanded respect, or perhaps fear, with its towering presence, 
and for a moment I found myself rooted to the spot, wondering if the pursuit of history's shadows was worth the chilling embrace of this place. My boots crunched on the carpet of frozen leaves as I finally compelled myself forward. The door yielded with a reluctant groan, protesting the invasion of its long-standing solitude. Inside, the mansion's grandeur had succumbed to the ravages of time. Its once vibrant tapestries now faded, its opulent furniture cloaked in the dust of decades. As I ventured deeper, each step reverberated through the hollow corridors, amplifying my solitude. The echoes were my only companions, mimicking my movements with ghostly precision, a haunting reminder of the absence of life within these walls. The silence seemed almost sentient, watching me with unseen eyes, breathing down my neck with each draft that whispered through the cracks and crevices. There was a sensation of being swallowed whole by the mansion's cavernous maw, the darkness hungry for stories yet untold. My flashlight beam cut through the oppressive, black-casting monstrous shadows that twisted and turned with my every move. The mansion's secrets lay heavy in the air, an unseen burden that pressed against my chest as I moved forward. I strained my ears, hoping to catch the subtle creaks and sighs of the structure settling, anything to break the smothering quiet. But there was nothing, only the steady rhythm of my footsteps and the erratic drumming of my heart, echoing off the walls as if to remind me, you are alone. Thomas Aldridge, utterly alone in this forgotten relic of the past. I pushed open the heavy carved door, its hinges crying out in protest, as if warning me to turn back. The air within the study was stale, tinged with the musk of mold and the sharp scent of aged paper. My flashlight's beam danced across the room, illuminating walls of books that stood like silent sentinels guarding long-forgotten knowledge. Dust motes swirled in the air, caught in the transient glow of my artificial day. Among the relics and leather-bound volumes, a solitary diary lay sprawled on the mahogany desk. Its spine cracked from use. It seemed almost sacrilegious to disturb it, but my fingers were drawn to its presence, betraying a thirst for the secrets it held. I felt the grit of dust under my fingertips as I traced the embossed cover before gingerly lifting it. The ancient pages creaked as I opened them, revealing neat, faded script that marched across the yellowed parchment. With each word I deciphered, a sickening chill crept down my spine. The diary spoke of a winter so brutal, so relentless, that it had stripped away humanity's veneer, leaving behind a primal savagery. The townspeople, once jovial neighbors, had turned on one another, not in hunger, but in hunger. My breath hitched in my chest, my own saliva turning to ash in my mouth. These were not mere tales meant to frighten children into obedience. These were confessions, and in desperation, of a community reduced to consuming its dead to stave off the inexorable embrace of their own mortality. I recoiled, the diary slipping from my trembling hands the thud of its fall, a death knell in the silence of the forsaken study. The silence of the study was shattered by the echoes of my pounding heart, a staccato rhythm that mocked the stillness. With each throb, I felt myself sinking deeper into the macabre tapestry woven by the town's cursed legacy. The air seemed to thicken, heavy with the specter of unspoken atrocities that clung to the walls like cobwebs. With a gentle push, the door creaked open, revealing a hidden room swathed in darkness. My eyes adjusted slowly to the gloom, uncovering rows upon rows upon rows of sagging shelves burdened with decaying archives and time-worn documents. I could taste the mustiness of the paper, feel the weight of history pressing against the walls. The stillness of the room was a deceptive companion. Within it, I could hear the echoes of long-forgotten voices. They called out from the depths of the archives, a spectral chorus narrating tales of woe and terror. As I pieced together the fragmented accounts, a network of horrors began to emerge, a macabre web spun across generations. 
Each new revelation sent a chill skittering down my spine, a sensation not entirely born of the cold. It was as though the spirits of the past were nestled close, whispering their secrets directly into my ear, their icy breath a specter upon my neck. The hunger that had driven the townspeople to madness seemed to claw at the edges of the room, seeking entry into the present. The sun dipped below the horizon with a final bloody smear across the sky, and in its absence, night seized the mansion with greedy tendrils. Shadows unfurled from every corner. I stood still in the heart of the study, the weight of dusk settling over me like a shroud. The air itself seemed to thicken, charged with an ancient malevolence that crept along my skin, raising every hair in instinctive warning. I could almost taste the darkness as it grew, a bitter tang of rust and earth that clung to the back of my throat. An unease twisted inside me, coiling tighter with each creak and groan of the old mansion. I strained my ears, hoping for the familiar reassuring sound of my own breath, yet what reached them was far more sinister, a faint whispering, as if a congregation of voices had risen from the very walls. The whispers swirled around me, a chorus of the vengeful dead roused from their eternal silence by the intrusion of the living. Their words were indistinct, but their intent clear. I was unwelcome, an interloper who had awakened memories best left slumbering beneath layers of dust and time. My heart stumbled in its rhythm, a startled bird within my chest, struggling against the cage of my ribs. These spirits, once townsfolk bound by a gruesome secret, now seemed bound to me as well. Their spectral chains forged by my relentless pursuit of the truth. What had been a hunger for knowledge now twisted into a gnawing realization that I had disturbed something ancient and unforgiving. The diary lay open on the desk, its yellowed pages a testament to the horrors they recounted, and I felt its silent judgment. I had touched its secrets, let them seep into my mind, where they took root like pernicious weeds. With each revelation, I had invited the past into the present, unearthing a history that clawed at the edges of reality, demanding recognition. Time stretched out, thin and fragile, as if each second were a delicate thread ready to snap under the weight of the unseen. The shadows continued their silent ballet upon the walls, a performance for an audience of one, a man caught between the realms of the known and the unknown, his fate entwined with the restless spirits that hungered for acknowledgement, for peace. My pulse hammered in my ears, a frantic drumbeat urging me to flee. The whispers had grown into murmurs, a cacophony of voices that chased me from the forsaken mansion into the streets lined with dilapidation. The once grand edifices of the town stood as hollow sentinels, their windows like darkened eyes that watched me with cold indifference. I was trapped, ensnared in a web spun by the cursed town's legacy, a legacy written in blood and hunger. I ran, my feet pounding against the cobblestone, each echo a chilling reminder that I was alone in this ghostly place. The frigid air bit at my lungs, and with every breath, I felt the oppressive weight of countless winters past, Time seemed to have lost its meaning here, the night stretching into an endless void that cloaked the town in its suffocating grasp. The narrow streets formed a labyrinth with no discernible exit. My heart raced in desperation, a relentless tempo that matched the urgency of my escape. Panic clawed at the edges of my consciousness, threatening to unravel the fabric of my resolve. I could feel it an unseen force drawing nearer with each passing moment, the shadows reaching out as if to pull me back into the darkness from whence I came. In the dim light cast by the waning moon, I stumbled upon relics of the village's past. The skeletal remains of gardens lay barren, covered by a shroud of frost that glimmered under the pale glow. It was here, among the remnants of life long since extinguished, that the reality of the town's sins rose up to confront me. The specters of the cannibalistic winter manifested before my very eyes, hollow gazes from faces starved of flesh, 
skeletal hands outstretched, as though begging for the sustenance that would never come. Their silent screams echoed within me, a chilling symphony that resonated with the agony of their fate. With each step, the haunting visage of those lost souls etched itself deeper into my psyche. Their despair was palpable, a thick miasma that clung to my skin, seeped into my pores, and filled me with an icy dread. This wasn't merely history. It was a testament to the depths of human depravity, a reminder of what one is driven to when pushed beyond the brink of survival. Breathless, the air escaping my lips in ragged gasps, I pressed on through the desolate streets, the restless spirits of the town's dark winter nipping at my heels. Their presence was a constant thrum in my veins, a relentless surge that propelled me forward, even as it threatened to consume me whole. The moon hung low, a silent witness to my flight, casting an ethereal glow over the white expanse. Shadows danced macabre waltzes across the frosted cobblestones, and I dared not look too closely, lest I discern faces within their twisted forms. Faces of those whose stories were now woven into the tapestry of my nightmares. Silvery light bathed the jagged rooftops and skeletal trees, creating a tableau both hauntingly beautiful and mercilessly cruel. It stood there, silent and brooding, an ever-present specter in the periphery of my vision. The taste of terror lingered on my tongue, a bitter reminder that although I had escaped its icy clutches, the essence of that place would remain a part of me, forever imprinted in the depths of my being. With each step away from that place of nightmares, the weight of inevitability pressed down upon me. I was a vessel of unwanted truths destined to carry them through the corridors of time. The town's hunger lay dormant for now, but it would rise again, as certain as the night swallows the day. I woke up to a world shrouded in silence, so profound it was like being submerged in the depths of an ocean with no surface in sight. My chest tightened, a silent gasp escaped my lips, but made no sound, my voice stolen by this unnatural hush that enveloped me. Disoriented, I fumbled through the darkness, my hands reaching out for something, anything that might anchor me to reality. As my eyes adjusted to the faint light, I scrutinized the forest that had been alive with nocturnal whispers just hours before. Now stiflingly quiet, the absence of sound clawed at my senses, a ceaseless void where even the rustle of leaves or the distant hot of an owl would have been a solace. But there was nothing, just the suffocating stillness that seemed to press against my eardrums demanding attention. Fear crept through my veins, cold and slithering, as I contemplated the possibility of never hearing again. The chirping of birds at dawn, the whispering breeze through the trees, or the comforting cadence of a friend's laughter. Panic fluttered in my chest, but I quelled it with a breath that I couldn't hear. I couldn't succumb to the terror. I had to find a way out of this nightmare. The silence was a riddle wrapped in shadow a challenge laid out by the unseen entity that lurked at the fringes of our understanding. Its motives were inscrutable, but I knew we had awakened something ancient, something that craved the quiet like a parched throat craves water. It fed on our fears, growing stronger as we grew weaker. Think, Avery, I whispered to myself, the words lost in the oppressive air. I strained to remember any shred of folklore or occult knowledge that might provide a clue, a key, to lifting this heavy shroud. But the answers were maddeningly elusive, slipping through my thoughts like smoke. I blinked away the fog of slumber, my resolve from moments before now a brittle shell around me. In the unnatural quiet, each movement seemed to broadcast ripples through the air, yet nothing stirred in return. The forest was a vacuum, and we were the dust moti suspended within it, each of us grappling with the absence of sound in our own way. John's eyes were like those of a man who had glimpsed something beyond comprehension. He sat apart from us, his back against a gnarled tree, knees drawn up to his chest, 
His once warm smile was gone, his demeanor growing colder as the silence ate away at him. I reached out, my hand hovering over his shoulder, but he flinched from the contact as if from a flame. John, I mouthed, my voice a prisoner of the still air. He simply shook his head, his eyes hollow, retreating further into his cocoon of despair. Contrasting John's despondence, Sasha's figure was taut, wired with a tension that spoke of inner turmoil turned outward. Her dark gaze darted between shadows, fingers twitching as if ready to ward off invisible assailants. Suspicion clouded her expression when she caught me watching her. Can't trust anything, she scrawled furiously on a piece of paper, shoving it in my direction before snatching it back, crumpling it in her fist. Easy, Sasha. I tried to communicate through tight-lipped empathy, but she wasn't looking for solace. She was gearing up for a fight against phantoms, only she could see. Callum stood, pacing like a caged animal, his footsteps silenced by the curse. His face was etched with lines of aggression, a stark contrast to Nadia's attempts at placating gestures, which he swatted away with a ferocity that left no room for doubt. This silent world was fracturing us, turning friend against friend. And then, as if the forest itself sensed the peak of our discord, it presented a new enigma, a glint of something other amidst the underbrush. My heart pounded a solitary drumbeat as we gathered around, the group strife momentarily forgotten. Nestled between twisted roots lay an artifact, its age impossible to guess. It was a small statue wrought from a material that drank in the scant light, a figure neither human nor animal that seemed to pulse with a life of its own. Runes spiraled down its base, their meaning teasing the edges of my occult knowledge. Could this be? Zara began, her voice trailing off into silence, her question hanging unfinished in the void. My fingertips brushed the cold surface, and a shiver ran through me, not of cold, but of recognition. The runes, the shape, they resonated with a story half-remembered, a warning unheeded. This was a relic of the entity, a piece of its essence, perhaps even the source of its power. Is it safe? Nadia signed, her hands cutting through the stillness with urgent grace. I withdrew my hand, the feeling of connection too intense, too intimate. I don't know, I admitted silently to myself, locking eyes with each of them in turn. We stood there bound by a shared uncertainty, the artifact a silent testament to the ancient force that held us in its grasp. I turned from the relic, a chill clinging to my spine. The others followed, their faces etched with the same unease that gnawed at my insides. We pressed on through the dense forest, the silence around us like a shroud, suffocating and unrelenting. Look, Sasha mouthed, her fingers trembling as she pointed to another carving, a series of jagged lines that seemed to pulse with a life not their own. She was right to be afraid. These were not the markings of wayward teens or the idle work of campers. They spoke of something older, something that knew the woods far better than we ever could. John lagged behind, his shoulders hunched, eyes vacant. He no longer bore the smile that once seemed as much a part of him as the air he breathed. Breathed too quietly now in this realm of silence. His disconnection from the sounds of nature, once his solace, left him adrift in a sea of despair. Nadia's steps were careful, deliberate, as if trying not to offend the forest itself. Her warmth, usually a beacon, flickered dimly in the oppressive quiet, her brown eyes darting to each of us, silently pleading for cohesion. My thoughts raced alongside my heart. The entity, it was here, it had to be. It reveled in the absence of sound, feasted on our disorientation like a leech drawing blood. As the realization dawned on me, icy dread cooled in my stomach. Every silent step we took was a dance to its. We were intruders here in a place that did not welcome the living. With each symbol that mocked us from the trees, each sensation of invisible eyes burrowing into our souls, 
the truth became clear. We had awakened something ancient, something malevolent, a curse that thrived in the crushing stillness. But what could we offer to a deity whose appetite was the absence of sound? Our minds raced, the weight of the decision pressing down upon us like the heavy air that filled our lungs, yet offered no relief. My breath fogged in the chill air, a silent testament to life in a world that had forgotten sound. The others were shadows in the dim light, their movements sluggish and faces gaunt. Each day, the silence gnawed at us, an unseen beast feasting on our will to endure. We gathered in a clearing, the ancient artifact before us, a stone altar, its surface marred by the passage of time and etched with symbols that made my skin crawl. It radiated a cold aura, as if feeding off our trepidation. Is this it? I whispered to myself, unsure whether my voice would betray us, even though it couldn't be heard. Avery approached the altar, tracing the engravings with a hesitant finger, his expression was a mix of fascination and horror. To offer silence is to offer oneself, he read slowly. Maybe there's another way, I signed back, but my heart wasn't in it. Doubt crept into every corner of my mind, the entity's sinister presence lurking behind each thought. Our preparations were mechanical, each action heavy with the knowledge that we might be stepping closer to oblivion. We placed what little we had on the altar, tokens of our lives before the curse. But it felt hollow, a gesture rather than a true offering. Would our sacrifice suffice, or would we simply fade into the silence? Forgotten echoes of a nightmare without end? The forest answered with its oppressive stillness, a quiet so deep it roared in my ears. I could feel Avery's gaze on me, waiting for a sign, a shred of hope, but I had none to give. Sasha kept her distance, eyeing the tree line with suspicion, as though she might catch a glimpse of our tormentor lurking just beyond perception. And then, a shift in the air, a cold that seeped into bones and soul alike, a chill knot of this world, a thin wisp of mist curled around the altar, and for a heartbeat, I allowed myself to believe we had succeeded, that the silence would break like a fever, releasing us from its clutches. But the mist grew denser, coalescing into a form both nebulous and terrifyingly present. In the heart of it, shadows danced, mocking our fear with an almost playful malevolence. Did it work? Zara's eyes sought mine, brimming with a hope I couldn't share. I opened my mouth to respond, to offer some semblance of comfort or strategy, but the words, had there been any, remained unspoken, lost in the void that had become our world. The mist swirled faster, the shadows within elongating, reaching for us with tendrils of darkness. Our breaths came in ragged gasps, the only sound our hearts pounding in terror. We were transfixed, powerless, before the spectacle as the entity's form solidified, and a low hum began to resonate, a soundless vibration that promised unspeakable horrors. <laughs>